Fancy going for a bike ride, but not leaving your bed? Well, with this bedstead bike, you can do just that. Quite why and what it was for, I don't know, but either way, it's cool to see it. And it's even got a bedpan down there too. Won't be going near that though. On my never-ending quest to try and show you as much bike tech as possible, today I found myself at the UK's National Cycle Museum in Llandrindod Wells, which is in the middle of Wales. And while if the entrance is anything to go by, there's going to be some absolute gems behind me, because straight away there's a Sinclair C5, there's a rickshaw, there's even an old post office trailer there. Let's go inside and see what beauties I can uncover. Come on. The Itera, a bike which was made, I'm pretty sure, in conjunction or in some kind of collaboration with Volvo, but if not, I apologise for that factually incorrect bit of information. But why not then do away with steel frame tubes and replace it all with plastic? Yeah, there's a very good reason. These bikes were very flexible, very wobbly, and had the nickname of Blamanche on wheels. The reason being the colour and also the fact they rode just like a Blamanche. Uh, nothing more really to say about them other than plastic monstrosity. Apparently, there were a whopping 30,000 of these made, but very few actually sold. But don't worry, they didn't all go into landfill. Instead, they went out to the Caribbean, where rust apparently is a major problem for bicycles out there, so at least they did go to some good homes. In 1818, this was what the dandy boys of the time were parading around the streets on, if you like. Um, that's probably all they did because it certainly wouldn't have been that comfortable. It was rather just go out and hang out with their friends, although I doubt they hung out. It was probably something a lot more regal than that. But yes, this, the hobby horse, the Dracine. This one, a modern remake by Johnson's of London. A wooden frame, we've got iron tyres on there. And while the forearm rest here, this was used exactly for that. So you could just rest and catch up on current affairs with your other industrial revolution friends. So I guess it's easiest explained as the hobby horse, a balance bike, but for adults, just like this one for kids. Fancy a motorbike, but more bike than motor? Well, this could have been the thing for you. This is an old rally bike. I'm not sure exactly what year it's from, but we've got a mini motor here stored away just behind the saddle where you'd normally have a pannier rack or something. So I guess it's probably a two stroke engine. I'm not sure how many cc, but there's a little wheel which is underneath the actual motor here and it presses down onto the tire and that spins and propels you along. Not the most subtle thing, I imagine fairly noisy too. And importantly, it's got a registration plate on the back. And here, this controls the actual throttle, this little lever here mounted on the top tube. If the hobby horse wasn't very comfortable, then the Velocipede, also known as the Bone Shaker, it lived up to its name. Largely built from iron, as you can see, with the exception of the wooden wheels, this thing would certainly have rattled the bones as you cycled along. Importantly, we now have pedals integrated here into the front wheel drive system. And this one here, the Pierre Michaud from Paris, is said to be the kind of Rolls Royce of bone shakers. I'll take their word for it. I don't want to even give it a go. But something I'm just going to point out, you do have a little bit of suspension here in the sort of top tube, I guess you could say, where the saddle is fitted. And the brake, well, it was done merely through a bit of cord system, which used some pulley wheels and then a kind of spoon, if you like, touched down on the rear iron tire. That's right, iron, no rubber. The extension that comes out of the head tube or fork crown, I guess it's the head tube. Uh, this isn't hang your bags of shopping on, instead it's to actually rest your feet if you are going down a hill, for instance. Remember, it is essentially a fixed wheel. Whilst I look down there, yeah, those are brass pedals. That is so fancy. The Sinclair C5 then, not a bike, not a car, but instead an e-powered trike. Now these were launched back in 1985 when the government here in the UK actually relaxed its laws around electronically propelled bicycles because they weren't then classed as a motorbike. However, it wasn't a success. Uh, the main reason being the range on it was just 20 miles, so not really that far. And also the position of it too. Riders were very low to the ground, so they didn't feel necessarily that safe in traffic. Uh, now that range of 20 miles, it was powered by a 250 watt motor, but the motor, it didn't work that well because the weight of this is about 50 kilos in total. So in 
comparison to modern day bikes, when you've got an e-bike, which is more than capable for running for a couple of hours or more, even on full power, this thing, yeah, it didn't go very far whatsoever. It had a top speed of 15 miles per hour, if you could get up to it. It was an absolute failure of Sinclair, uh, but it was actually great to see this sort of thing happen. If this had never been tested, I wonder if we'd be where we are today with e-bikes. I wouldn't like to use it though. Just look where the handlebars are, underneath your thighs. Yeah, I'm glad this one uh, they're not gonna let me use today. The penny farthing then. Yep, a pretty popular bike, it has to be said. Way back in 1885, there were over 400,000 cyclists using them in Britain alone, which is absolutely mind-blowing, I reckon. I don't know very much about them. Instead, I leave the penny farthing exploits, also known as the ordinary, for James and Chris, because they go around trying to break world records on them and stuff. But something here, which is really cool, and I'm just gonna show you, are these ladies' tricycles that we use, because back in the 1880s and such, women weren't really encouraged to ride bicycles. In fact, it was quite often frowned upon, especially if they even attempted to ride a penny farthing. So that's why they had something like this. And I guess you could say that they maintain their modesty. I think I'm allowed to say that because by doing so, they wouldn't be revealing anything due to the seating position. Now, something really cool about it has to be the handbrake here, much like a, a vehicle. And also the steering was controlled by this sort of single-handed lever. I wouldn't mind to go on this though. It looks pretty cool. Reverse penny farthing, anyone? Mm, nah, not for me. It looks like a hot rod. Stick to the traditions. Come on, people. Picture yourself. It's the 1930s, you and your partner, you've just got married, you don't have enough money for a car. Not to worry, go out and get yourself a tandem. Then comes along the little one. Well, you can't leave them at home, can you? So instead, why not get yourself one of these? A sidecar, but for a bike. I've never, ever seen one of these, ever. It's the Watsonian in its brand, and they actually made some for uh, motorbikes. This one has a quick-release coupling. You don't require any special tools or anything. It's just got some little wing nuts on there. So, providing you've got a good, firm grip, your loved one is gonna stay nice and safe inside of that sidecar. And if that's not enough to tickle your fancy and take the little one out on a bike ride with you, well, they're not gonna scream, they're not gonna get wet, because there's a cover that goes over the top, and you won't even hear them if they do start screaming. Old advertising paraphernalia is in abundance here, and I absolutely love it, the different styles and designs and everything, and this one here really caught my eye. The reason being, I still use Velox tubular tape on my own tubulars when I tape them onto my wheels, because quite often I can't be bothered with the hassle of glue. I might even ask as well if I can maybe buy this one off them, because I really do like it. Can I? No, I don't reckon you'll let me. Here's one then I've never seen before, the Simpson lever chain from 1895. Something which is different, let's face it, from a standard chain out there. And one of the reasons behind its design is that the brand themselves actually thought that it would allow a better power transfer when laying down those wattage bazookas through the pedals. And sales did flourish for a number of years, and in fact three. I'll get onto that shortly though. Uh, now, the reason they flourished was largely down to the riders that were using it. The riders using them were actually taking part in paced events on a velodrome. So you can imagine a triplet or a quadrant and a five man or five person uh, bicycle were pacing a rider around a track. Uh, and essentially it was like a derny race, if that makes sense. However, the company was short lived. In 1898, it did in fact go bust, uh, largely due to the fact that other transmissions were being introduced into the market and the fact that each bike had to be built around this rather funky arrangement of chain. The Dursley Pedersen then, the brainwave of Danish engineer Michael Pedersen and were built by a company in Dursley near Gloucester in the UK from between 1896 and 1914. And well, around about this time actually, bicycles became to look a lot more normal and traditional if you like, but this was so different. Just look at the style of frame. It resembles what the molten fold-up bikes look like these days, kind of the very thin tubing and lots of different joins and you don't really know what's going on. But the standout bit about it has to be the hammock-like saddles that are on them. And you still see people riding around on them. I think there's a few makers out there on the continent too who also produce them. I'm really keen to ride one. I saw a guy riding on one a couple of years ago and he did say to me, would I like a go on it? But I don't, I just don't like riding other people's bikes, but this is one design 
I just want to have a go on one day. Here's one for you then, the Eiffel Tower bike, designed purely for advertising reasons, and not just because you would look, quite simply, pretty much ridiculous riding around on it because of the height of it. It's about 12 foot high up there, so you are gonna need a little bit of assistance. But on this actual frame of the bike, that would be complete with some advertising placards. You could ride around advertising a brand to your heart's content. I guess you could even call yourself a professional cyclist for that matter. For those of you who are into your bamboo bikes, you may well be thinking that you're on the upward curve, if you like. Well, that curve actually started way back in the 1890s. Check out this one. An early attempt, really, at a lightweight bicycle, I guess, because there's none of that heavy old iron that would have been used previously. We've even got some bamboo mud guards on there, not to mention these little pump pegs. I like the look of it, and that looks to me like a little oil filling cap down there for the bottom bracket. I like the look of this one, just not the brakes, no. Recumbent bikes were pretty popular in mainland Europe during the 1930s and 1920s, something of a bit of a fashionable, cool item to have. And the 1932 Triumph Moller that I've got here took some inspiration from it. We have a laid back approach to it, just check out that saddle with a little bit of lumbar support there as well, so a nice easy going ride. But the standout feature on it has to be the steering wheel. That's right, a steering wheel instead of a traditional handlebar setup. Um, and the brakes on there, sort of, the bikes, old bikes, they fill me with fear, to be perfectly honest, with the braking systems on them. It's just the way they look so fragile and not ideal in an emergency. But well, the Triumph Moller, it didn't really take off, let's face it, but it's good to see it. And I've even seen some hacks or bodies on the GCN show that utilize a steering wheel too. And well, I guess you could even pretend you were driving a car. John Boyd Dunlop, the man who patented the pneumatic tyre way back in 1888. We can thank him, really, for what we're using today. Although I guess someone along the way would have still made the tyre, but still, someone has to start the revolution. We've got a replica here of that original tyre, and also an example from the Dunlop News Magazine of 1898 of customer service letters of people thanking him for such great tyres. How cool is that? even got their addresses too. Bikes aren't always about racing on though, are they? Let's face it. Instead, this one here was designed to sell ice creams from it. So it's been restored by the staff here and it's a pre-World War II little bit of kit. Um, now it is gonna weigh an awful lot, let's face it, when it's weighed up with all your different favored ice creams and everything inside of it. So we've got a pair of drum brakes that are rodded up to the lever on the kind of handlebar style setup. Now, in interestingly, the handlebar, that is gonna be quite difficult to maneuver around too. I wouldn't like to ride around on this too much myself. Uh, the rear brake is controlled via this lever. We've got a single speed gearing, which is a pretty low setup too, because remember, once that's fully loaded, it's not gonna be easy to ride around with. Aged pretty well. Just above, you've got an RAC bicycle. The RAC, or the Royal Automobile Club, is a breakdown service here in the UK, and their mechanics used to actually patrol the streets aboard bikes that had a small pouch with the necessary tools in there to repair many common motoring incidents. Imagine that these days. No, it wouldn't happen. Cars are so complicated. Yeah, they used to ride around on those. That'd be a cool thing. Who remembers those? If anyone does, please leave a comment down below. There we are, the National Cycle Museum in Flandrin Dodd Wells in Wales. I've absolutely loved it. I feel like I've barely even scratched the surface because there was so much in there. Everywhere I looked, looks up, looked down, looked side to side, there was absolutely packed to the rafters with bits and pieces. So a huge thanks to them for letting me come and get these grubby little hands all over bits of kit. Let me know what your favorite bit was down there in the comment section below. And as ever, remember to like and share this video with your friends too. Don't forget to check out the GCN shop at shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com. And now for two more great videos, how about clicking just down here and just down here. Can I go back? <laughs>